Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Go Big with Mika. That's me. I'm Mika Goldberg, founder and CEO of Go Big Coaching and Communications. And I am all about helping women, especially in male dominated industries, sleep with confidence because my mission is to really get. 51% of power positions in this world into female hands um, during my lifetime, preferably while I'm still lucid. So we have to ramp up the speed here a little. Um, today, I am super, super excited to have Katrina Levy Seidel on. She's a friend and she's a fellow coach. We've known each other for a couple of years from a coaching community. And Katrina and I, had an event earlier this year together in Cleveland, an in-person event, it was so exciting, uh, presenting about confidence and identity um, to women in cybersecurity. And we had a, a very interesting conversation before the start of our event about self-trust. The, that's why I wanted to make that the topic of our conversation today. Welcome, Katrina. Thank Glad you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. And I, I, I love how you brought in the uh, how we met peace and the male dominated industry. Really, I feel like that was our first connection when we um, met each other, right? I worked wow. in the PI business, which was mostly men and, and you in the car industry. So yeah. Yeah, so that's all very, very male dominated. And the PI business, people are probably already curious what's going on there. <laughs> um, and you will share that story. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody who sees us live, please feel free to post in the comments. Uh, tell us where you are in the world. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment at any time. We'll try to answer them uh, right away. And if you watch that later, please always feel free to reach out to me or Katrina. You have our uh, LinkedIn information in the event, and uh, I'll share all the other information as well when we're done here. All right, so the PI industry. Actually, we'll start a little earlier than that um, because our conversation about self trust. Uh, centered around the two of us talking about our uh, academic, the end of our academic careers. Mm, mine was relatively late, so I had a master's degree. Hello, David. Uh, hey, David. In the same in the same event, so that's great. Thanks to thanks for joining us here, and we can see a comment. Yay! Um, so. My, the end of my academic career came relatively late uh, in a PhD program, of which I dropped out. And I mean, I felt so, so guilty for so long. I mean, it was just like I had a master's degree. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And I still, uh, it cost me so much time to work through um, dropping out of a program, just like generally, uh, because it went so much against my high achieving self and all these things. And then Katrina shared her story with me, which I would invite her to do now with you. And that is a very different take on it. And so I really loved that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, mine was was different. I heard you, you know, say you felt guilty. I actually felt relieved. I was at the Ohio State University and I was in my third year and I still hadn't really figured out what you know, I wanted to select as a major what I was really interested in. And I was really struggling with that. It was a, it was a massive school. It's a, it's a phenomenal school. But mm -hmm. um, as I was, uh, you know, going through um, my mind, like, what am I doing? Everyone here knows what they're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I really uh, began to ask myself, do I really belong here? And the more that I began asking that question to myself, I, I realized that I was ready to make a radical decision that no one was doing. And it was my college was paid for. It was like crazy. Um, but I really discovered at that time, um, that was the first time I tapped into, Hmm, I'm going to trust myself on this and I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And so I left the Ohio state university my third year and I felt relieved. That is so huge. I yeah. mean, leaving yeah. college, especially mm -hmm. if the financing is in place, it's not a necessity mm -hmm. just by saying, I feel that I don't 
belong here. This is not this is not right for me. I think that's 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 huge and at that age especially. Yeah. So, and there's a lot of external noise. There's a lot of external uh, opinion. Yeah. And so to be able to come back in to say, huh, I'm really young. You know, I'm, I'm practicing this. Um, and uh, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it felt inside. It felt right. And that's that's really amazing because I just wanted to ask. So uh, how did your family respond? Your friends? I'm sure you had professors who uh who encouraged you to continue and all these things so how did you yeah. have at that young age you were like 20 19 20 21 20 21, yeah. right. and, you know it's funny at first there was a lot of resistance and are you nuts what are you doing like this is mm -hmm. it's not something you know i was i was very socially happy i was in a sorority i was really involved there but and i had a boyfriend but i was like I, this piece over here is just really really heavy it felt really heavy uh, so there was a lot of, um, you know, opinion mm -hmm. from my family, certainly, and friends and, you know, what are you doing? Questioning, you know, questioning me. And I kept going, well, is this right? Should I do this? And, and but the more that I asked myself, the more that I really tapped in and connected with myself, I'm like, I know this looks crazy, but it feels right. And so I, 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 I continued to, to pursue, you know, how I was feeling with my, my knowingness, uh, even though it appeared on the outside by everyone else to be an insane decision um, crazy yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but what happened so at first crazy right and then as i became more confident with my decision it's it's interesting how people come along and go ah cool okay now we see it mm -hmm. yeah so i mean I'm, I'm still i love that story because it's so rare uh somewhere most of us just lose that type of self-trust when we're really young yeah my kids have it. Mm -hmm. Kids have it. Um, and then some people are beaten down, uh, hopefully metaphorically, and not all of um, But it's just, it's trained out of us by yeah. shoulds, by society, by expectations, by all these things. And it takes a lot of people a way longer time to come back to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's so amazing. I feel like at the age where peer pressure is highest, like a teenage and young adult, uh, when the peer pressure is so high, yeah. you manage to do that. Mm -hmm. um, how does that factor in with my big topic of confidence, that self-trust that you showed? Yeah, it's interesting. They, they, they go hand in hand, really. Um, you know, the more self-trust that you have, the more confidence you have in your decision making, right? And the more confidence you have, the more trust you have in yourself. It's like, it's like a whole, you know, they, one feeds into the other. And so the more that you practice self-trust and you know what it, it looks like and you have that moment that you can go back to, I, I, I go back to that moment often and think, wow, as, as I look back on that, like I was really, it was really courageous. Mm -hmm. Not have yeah. practiced it, uh, you know, prior to, you know, consistently, it was a leap of faith, but it was it was this feeling of man. I, I just it feels right, even though it looks wrong from the outside world. And as I've gone through life, I've continuously gone back to that that anchor moment for myself. And as I keep connecting um, other other decisions, um, it gets easier. It gets stronger. That knowingness gets stronger. Yeah, that's, that's, I think, important for, for everybody who watches this to learn that in the beginning, it's always hard and it gets the more of those decisions you take um, and also have some, I mean, not all of them might work out perfectly as well, perfect. We always said that, we put that in quotes, but you just learn to trust yourself more because it feels right to you and then it becomes easier. David, I just uh, showed that comment here, agrees with me that what a, <laughs> what a, how amazing it is that you had that clarity at that, or like that courage, courage mm -hmm. at this young age when most of us are a bit of a mess or lost or mm -hmm. all these things. Yeah. So, Thank um, you, David. Yeah. It's, so I used to refer to it, you yeah. know, I used to look at it as a failure. I was like, man, I dropped out of college. Like what a failure. And that was early on, you know, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, because I was comparing myself to other people and to expectation. But as I began to really think about that decision and, and the enormity of it at that age or really at any age, um, mm -hmm. to make a, such a, a courageous decision and to stick with it and, and to just have this trust that you've made it for a reason. It wasn't made, you know, um, you know, reactively or, you know, mm -hmm. um, instantaneously. Mm -hmm. It was like, I thought this out and this is why. Um, you know, it's really helped me to to continue to trust myself and and to know that um, it's not a failure. It's it's a it's an early uh, success story for me to continue to do that, even when it you know the uncertainty is there. So yeah, and I think you just said something really uh, interesting for for uh, some of our viewers who might be like, yeah, but I don't I don't hear my gut that much. I don't have that 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 mm. voice. Uh, there's still an element of really thinking things through. It's not that you need to feel something and just go and change your entire life for that moment. There is a combination of a sense of, I don't know, unease. I'm not in the right place. I don't belong. There must be something else for me out there in combination with just um, a, a, a thinking, a rational process of, okay, so what would this mean for me down the road and how am I, how am I handling this, mm -hmm. et cetera, yeah. right? I think it's the awareness that something feels off mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not sure why it feels off or why it's, you know, I'm yeah. having this feeling though and really recognizing it and then um, getting curious and, and really exploring why it's it's coming forward. And, mm -hmm. and from there, you know, I feel like that's the, uh, and, and then your intuition, right? Mm -hmm. It feels like making this next choice feels right. Yeah. We oftentimes will talk ourselves out of it um, by overthinking it. Mm -hmm. But the more that we tap into and practice, you know, being guided by our intuition, our gut feeling, and um, and, and not just that certainly, but validating that that's that is that feeling is the right one. Um, it gets stronger. Have you developed over the years, because uh, mm -hmm. we are now a little later, a couple of decades later, um, have you have you uh, have you used a certain process back then or um, by now? Do you have a process now to make sure that your self trust and your intuition has a strong say in what you do? Yeah, I, the first thing that is really um, has been really helpful for me is to know that I am the only person mm -hmm. that is like me. Yeah. I am, you know, I, I've stopped, you know, trying to compare myself to, well, this person is, you know, has this, or this person is this. Um, they do. But the difference is, is that who I am will never be like anybody else. And so it's celebrating and, and really authenticating that piece. I'm special. I'm different. I'm unique. Right. Mm -hmm. And so my decisions are going to be different from yours or from my neighbors because we aren't the same person. And so when I learned to come back to me and comparing myself to maybe me a year ago versus me comparing myself to you, that was a huge eye opener for, I don't, I, I can do what I want. I can make the choices I want that, are, that feel right for me. And so it was awareness and then it was really embracing who I am. Yeah. For starters, right. And then from there, it's, you know, connecting into that feeling within myself. What's the, what's the inner chatter that's going on? Is it aligning with my decision? If not, why? What's the, what's the separation? Which, what's the conflict? And so it's, it's really connecting into um, who I am and declaring what makes me different and, and honoring that versus trying to fit in and, and be like everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I know that you do a lot of work around identity. So I hear that in there, of course. And we will come to that in a minute. But before I would like to, I would like our listeners, uh, it's an audience, uh, to hear a little bit more about what you did next, because that's where the PI thing comes in. And that's a really yeah. interesting so what do you do next when you leave when you when you when you drop out of college what do you do you get a job mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I was like I need to make some money uh, so my father had started a small private investigative firm in Columbus Ohio and I decided I was gonna that was the the, the 
easiest thing for me to think of. I'm going to start making some money. So I jumped in and, and started really um, doing whatever they needed. I was, you know, I'd get lunches, I would answer phones, I would do whatever. And I really became interested in, in the cases that they were working. And so uh, my fascination continued to grow and I began working cases. And, um, you know, a year later, two years later, several years later, um, I, I found myself entrenched in this industry, which was mostly, mostly men. Um, although I will tell you over the years, I spent 18 years that, in that industry and the women, whew, man, are we good at detail and, and discovering and, and figuring things out. And, and that's not to say that the men aren't, but women have, um, I have found a uh, special detail um, um, uniqueness uh, where they're able to put the pieces together and, and find the big picture. But um, yeah, so it was an industry that I, I knew nothing about. Um, and not only did I go into the private investigative industry, I went into the automobile repossession industry, which is even more male dominated, right? Yeah. And so my father came to me one day and said, we'd love for you to run this department. And I was like, heck no, well, I don't even know what it is. What does that mean? And so um, I'll be honest with you. I was, uh, I was, I was intrigued. Um, I was scared. I was really young, um, but I, I ended up saying yes. And uh, I went out on my first repossession and this is not to scare anyone that does that's in this industry, but I will tell you my first repossession in the field, my tow truck driver, um, was uh, shot at and um, they hit him in the, the the face region. He did live and he's fine, but that was like, what am I doing? Is this nothing? Mm -hmm. uh, so I went, I, I began working in the office after that, but I, I tell you the story because um, it didn't make me run. It really made me want to know how we could create safer, you know, parameters mm -hmm. for our people in the field and how I could really get into this um, industry. And so we became one of the largest repossession companies in the uh, United States. And I learned that I may have been a very young 20 something year old, but my confidence grew as I became more competent and connected within the industry, learning all the facets of it. And um, I became an owner in my mid twenties, which was unheard of. Um, and I worked with mostly men, but I will tell you the 50 something year olds and the, you know, 20 something year olds and it didn't matter your age, I, they, we respected each other mm -hmm. uh, because they knew that they could count on me, that they could trust me to guide them in the right direction and to keep them safe. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love that we still have the word trust in here because uh, that is something where um, the first question while you told your story was, okay, your dad trusted you to run this before you had the trust mm -hmm. in yourself. Yeah. But later, of course, so how later, of course, people trusted you because you created a safe environment for them. So how does the trust of others figure in with the self-trust piece? Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> they're really pretty much, you know, it's the same. It's, it's trusting in yourself and it's trusting in, in something or, or someone. And, and that's built by, you know, consistency, right? Mm -hmm. By um, showing, you know, showing up consistently, um, um, you know, showing yourself authentically, right? If, mm -hmm. if I, you know, our BS meters go off when we're encountering someone that we're like, eh, something doesn't feel right here. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's give and take. Let me, let me tell you I'm going to do something and show you I'm going to do it versus let me tell you I'm going to do something and I, my actions speak differently. Mm -hmm. And so when you build that over time with yourself and others, you build trust and they become more confident in what they do as well and who they are because now they're like, oh, you know, it's that influence. It's super strong, right? When you're working with someone that you feel is confident in what they're doing and you trust them, um, you want to work just as as diligently and as um, you know efficiently as they do, and yeah. so it's it's um it's one thing to trust yourself, but you're also influencing other people to do the same and to join forces with you. Yeah. So, so thank you for sharing all yeah. that. So now I'm wondering how does how do these experiences how does that focus on trusting yourself going forward. How does that influence your work today as a coach? You know, it influences it greatly. One of the first things that people ask me when I begin coaching with them, I'll say, you know, what, what, if you could choose anything, what would you want my support in as a coach? Mm -hmm. You know, what are you looking to create? And they would, a lot of 
people say, I want you to help me have confidence. Mm -hmm. And I love that one because, you know, we don't get to give confidence to someone. It's not given out like that, right? It comes from having um, clarity and uh, consistency with something and courage, right? Lots and, of key words. Yes, they all play together. Yeah, competence in something. And then confidence comes, you know, from those things. And um, it's helped me greatly because what I do is, it, you know, confidence comes from knowing who you are. So, you know, part of confidence is really having a relationship with yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and really building that. And the way that you do that is to know who you are. And so as a coach, uh, confidence comes up, up a lot. And one of the things that has worked for me personally, um, when I left the PI firm in 2014 and I got home and I went, I have no idea what to do and I don't know who I am anymore because I'd attached so much of my identity mm -hmm. to what I did and the titles and the roles and the responsibility. And so when all of that went away, I was, lo I was like, what? Who am I? Oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. And so I began mm -hmm. to really discover that, you know, really identifying who you are versus what you do is the first step in, in knowing um, the direction that you're headed. And so I decided that I wanted to update my identity to be about um, values and principles and um, uh, aligning my thoughts and my actions with that versus, you know, how much, how many things I have, how much money I have, you know, the car I drive, things like that, because all of those things can be taken from you. And if that's the case and you've attached your identity to it, then who are you? Mm -hmm. That is one of the tools that I use in, in coaching. That, that's the first, that's the core of what I do is who are you? And let's, let's mm -hmm. work on that today. Not who everyone told you you were from birth because right. that has helped us create the stories and the patterns and, you know, the way that we show up that isn't serving us in, in, in a lot of cases. So. I feel that's a question that's super relevant to, to everybody anyway, but especially right now when we're seeing the great resignation. So there are lots of people who know that they are at a place where they don't want to continue to be. Yeah. And uh, I, I would say also on, on a personal side, a lot of people have experienced major losses uh, in those last couple of years. Um, and also the, the, the losses, the, the losses we experience in lifetimes, generally right um so let's say someone someone um is suddenly let's say newly without a partner mm -hmm. and not happy in corporate how can this this person um probably this woman um how how can this person start updating their identity where does that process start yeah. So one of the, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest tools, I love that the tools for, for really, you know, updating your identity is to really detach yourself from all of the things. And if you were to ask yourself, well, who am I? It's, it's kind of a fun question, right? Who, who walks up and says, so who are you? <laughs> well, I did have someone say that to someone once and it was. If you don't have a thousand coaches in your circle of friends, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> they usually say, what do you do? Where are you from? Mm -hmm. They don't say who are you. Um, and I'm not saying go out and start asking people who they are, but you know, for you to know it is really important. And, and you can begin to detach yourself from all the things and say, hmm, how would I describe myself if I couldn't, you know, use an extrinsic or an external thing, you know, mm -hmm. a natural thing. And so you, you get to come back to you and in defining who you are, um, by way of how you show up, by way of how you um, treat yourself, by way of how you um, um, act in life, right? And so I'm kind, I'm respectful, um, I'm funny, you know? So if you can come back to those characteristics and sometimes that's awkward, you know, we're like, I don't know, that's kind of weird talking about yourself, but it's the beginning of getting to know you and connecting with you. And so that's it is beginning to decide who you are now, who you want to become. You know, maybe you want to work on a piece of that. Maybe you're not as kind as you want to be. All right. You want to be kinder. Um, and really paying attention to what is going on inside your mind, your inside your head, you know, because we have an inner roommate that um, if we don't know who that, that 
roommate is, um, she or he will be, you know, chirping in your ear. And if it's not aligned with who you are today, it will continuously throw you off your path. You know, oh, I'm this. No, you're not. Who do you think you are? You mm -hmm. know, that voice inside will derail you. So it's really important to become aware of what it is and what it's saying and to, to, to have her or him do life with you. Um, and then from there, there are great tools. The greatest tool that I um, that I find um, the most impactful is to, as a person, really sit down and begin to define what your values are. What are the four or five values that you want to build everything on top of? Is it um, trust, respect, love, communication, creativity, whatever that is, and then the principles. Mm -hmm. The principles are it. That is your guide, your GPS to keep you on that path wherever you want to go and making sure that your action is aligned with it, making sure that your thought process is aligned with it. And when you get those things in tandem, they're all working together. You start to go in that, you, you start to see that progress and it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so you're not looking for someone to say, oh, great job, man, you awesome. I can see it. You're all, you already know it. You already have that inner knowing of, I know, you know, you're no longer seeking it from other people. We, it's like that, um, that inner knowing that keeps guiding you in that direction that you know you're already headed. It's be, it becomes clearer. Yeah. So. Yeah. We had a beautiful experience uh, with that updating identity at our joint in-person event in Cleveland with this room full of women. Mm -hmm. And we started to, to pass them the microphone around and everybody said one I am sentence that did not include um, things like a role, uh -huh. a professional role, and it did not include things like wife, mom, uh, private roles. Mm -hmm. And it was so beautiful to see all this. I am kind, I'm curious, I'm, I don't know, all these, all these things with a room full of, I don't know, 150 women. Mm -hmm. And there was one woman who then read her her personal statement to us mm -hmm. uh, where she had like, I don't know, 30, 50 of those characteristics. And she reads that to herself every morning. So- uh -huh. Wasn't that beautiful? It was, it was really, it, what I found most fascinating about that is that we, on the fly, we're, we were gonna do it digitally where yeah. we were hidden behind a screen. We thought, no, we're not doing that. Yeah. Let's, let's ask this group of, of women yeah. uh, if they would be willing to, to do an I am statement. And the first woman that we went up to um, was like, no way, I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. And so we passed the microphone to the next person. Yeah. And by the time we got all the way around the room, we went back over to her and said, are you ready now? Yeah. And she did it. Yeah. And what I loved about you sharing this is that the influence that we spoke about earlier, it's so strong when you, you know, when, when one person has the courage to do it, yeah. you find the next person maybe more willing to do it. Yeah. And you don't have to be the first all the time. I mean, yeah. in some things when you can be the first, please mm -hmm. go because you're, you're making it easier for others. But mm -hmm. if that's not you that day in that situation, that's fine too. But the energy in that room was amazing. And then, uh, seeing seeing women cheering themselves on because then some some said things like I'm a rock star <laughs> like it was so beautiful it, it was, was awesome it was awesome so um, that's really that's a good starting point for everybody to just say okay who do I want to be and really work through those values and, mm -hmm. and principles characteristics yeah and, yeah. The other thing too, Mika, is you know, once you are, you know, you're you're stepping into you and you're owning that, mm -hmm. um, and you're connecting to that inner voice and that inner gut feeling, right? And and you have your tools now. You're creating your your values and your principles that are that are keeping you on track. This is that that is the one thing I've had clients that have said I've integrated this into my my website. It's mm -hmm. how I make decisions when I want to work with uh, you know a new client. Yep. Whether on a, a yes or no, you know, and working with them, it's really it's, it really puts things into um, focus for you to know that when you're making a decision, it's it's aligned with your values and principles. Right. And then the the final piece really is executing action, right? It's action. practice. Mm -hmm. How do we get better at something? Well, we do it over and over again, and we keep fine tuning it. And so it's like 
it's scary at first to make that decision like I did when I was in college and you did, you know, in your, your um, PhD program, but it's once you do it, you, you have this, this confidence that comes from it. You're like, man, and you're look, we're going to make mistakes. That's if you don't make mistakes, man, keep, try harder. I don't know, you know, because the lessons are are in the mistakes where you can actually make it, you know, a lot better next time. And so get out there and try it. Try one, start with something smaller, certainly, but um, try it and see how you feel, you know, and then celebrate it. You know what, regardless of how you thought it was supposed to go, you know, you did it. Exactly, exactly. That's that's really that's really so huge. And I wish someone had taught me that lo a long, long time ago, much earlier in life, that failures only if you don't learn from things. Yeah. Really? I mean, things might not go the way the way you expect them to do uh, to go, maybe not the way you want them to go, maybe not the way anybody else wants them to go. But if you're ready and able and willing to learn from them, it's, it's like Edison and his 999 ways not to invent a light bulb. True. And we get so hung up on wanting to control so much. Mm -hmm. And, and really that that's that that stifles the create the creative process and the flow and you know it's um it's interesting once i began to to let go of trying to control the outcome or the expectation that i had that didn't get met i'm like man i'm really like messing this up if i can mm -hmm. just let go of the outcome and just be right here in the moment it's so beautiful it's so much more powerful and enjoyable and 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 the outcome's better than what i thought it could have been yeah and that's a hard, it's, it's a tricky thing to, to really work on because we're so, you know, influenced and programmed to, to be safe. Ah, if I know if I do this, it'll be safe. Yeah. I can control and, and predict the outcome. But the truth is, is go out there and, and, and do something and, and don't worry about the outcome. You know, feel like you've given everything in that moment and that you followed your gut and, and you felt like it was the right decision. And the outcome is is so much more incredibly beautiful and extraordinary than you could have imagined when you do it that way. So yeah. So as I just said, I wish I had learned that a lot earlier. I'm sure this uh, will. You are a mother yourself, and your your daughters are, are like Four. around that age yeah. when you started to make really big decisions. Um, and if someone else sees that and they have kids, teenage kids, or maybe young adults. How can they help them learn this lesson, or like even maybe have their smaller kids? So how can they learn, uh, help them learn this lesson earlier? What's the encouragement? Yeah, great question. Um, and I, I work with teenagers too. You know, it's it's allowing them to make their own choices, mm -hmm. small or as large, right? Um, you know, both of my daughters, you know, 14 and 16, um, have learned, they used to ask me, you know, will you call the salon for me and make an appointment? And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. You know, if you want it, call. And so of course you're, you know, you're nervous and you know, it's uncomfortable and oh my gosh, you're thinking about having to perfect your, your ask, you know, and, yeah. and the truth is, is the more that you do it, the, the more comfortable you are and the more comfortable you are, the better you are at it. And, and you build confidence in doing it next time. And so mm -hmm. that's with anything. I'm giving you such a simple example, but that's, yeah. you know, advocating for, I mean, and my children both have, you know, if they've had any type of, um, uh, issue or challenge at school have gone, listen, they, they've reached directly out to their, their, the principal or the vice principal and they're CCing me. I'm like, what is happening here? Cool. You know, mm -hmm. so it, it really teaches them to, to trust themselves that they can do it much sooner than we think they can. Yeah. We coddle and we, we, you know, carefully keep them safe and, Oh, we don't want them to fail. And the truth is, is, let them fail. Let them fail at this, like calling the salon and, and screwing it up. And, you know, mm -hmm. and they'll try a different way next time. Right. Um, and it's that simple concept, but it gets easier even with the bigger things. And before they know it, now they're, they're doing it. They're not even asking me, they're ceasing mm -hmm. me, you know? Yeah. So allow them to, to speak up and advocate for themselves. You know, on the other spectrum, I've seen, you know, uh, older, um, teenagers and younger adults or whatever, unwilling to speak up, unwilling to um, have a conversation. 
because mm-hmm. the fear stops them of, oh, this could be confrontational. We make up a story about what it's going to be. It's like, but maybe it won't be. Mm-hmm. And so we, we, we don't trust that um, we can have a conversation to, to ask for what we want. And the truth is, is you can. And the more you do it, the better you feel about yourself and, and the better you feel um, about how you uh, can handle things because you, you've built trust. Yeah. And I love that simple example, this call the salon and get your appointment because that is not very dangerous. That's only uncomfortable if you have never done that before. And uh, and that teaches you that, okay, I can ask for what I want. In this case, I just want an appointment. Uh, but that is the first step in asking for what I want on a larger scale. And I love that. That's uh and that's also easier for the parents, right? Say like, okay, we're starting here. We're starting here with the independent self-trust uh, building exercises. So Absolutely. you don't always have to leap over the cliff. I mean, you can shuffle outside of your comfort zone and take mm-hmm. the baby steps. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I say this all the time, but you know, I, I imagine what it would have been like had I, as you mentioned earlier, started really early as a teenager thinking, Hmm, who am I, you know, and what's important to me and, and really coming to coming back to me, you know, we, we look a lot outside of ourselves for support, for advice, for opinions, for, for help, for whatever. Um, and I'm not saying that that's bad. That certainly is necessary. Um, but it's also necessary to trust yourself too. And the more that we can build that trust with ourselves and listen to ourselves rather than dismissing it or silencing it or making up a story about how crazy it might be, or, you know, we, we just create these, these stories about what isn't true. And um, if we can stop for a moment and say, what's really true? And what is it that I want in this moment to create? What is it that isn't working for me? And to honor that and, and to know that one thought can create one shift that can create ultimately create the transformation and the creation that you're looking for. It's, I promise you, it's not rocket science. We as coaches, you know, we're in this day in and day out, but it takes that one moment that you're willing to open your mind to doing something and seeing something differently that really creates the, the, the um, movement. And there's, I mean, there's so much more help out there today. There's so much more awareness of, of these issues than there was like 20 years ago. I mean, what? I remember my one of my huge, maybe the big aha moment for me was uh, when I, between my master's and the failed PhD program, uh, when I accepted uh, a job uh, teaching college in the U.S. And I was like 25, fresh out of a master's program. And uh, and I arrived in this small town in the Midwest. Yeah. So, and uh, someone picked me up from, and drove me to an apartment. I'm like, okay, this is where I'm living now. Okay, this is my workplace. And I walked around the campus, and it hit me like this big thing. It's like, I am a clean slate here. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows anything beyond the skeleton of my resume. Mm. And even that has only been read by the people in my department or whatever the dean. Um, that's it. I'm not I'm not someone's daughter, someone's friend, someone's girlfriend, all these things. I can reinvent myself. And I didn't find it scary. I found it very exciting. Mm. Yeah, it, it is, right? It's free. Yeah. When, when someone first asked me about uh, the story that I was telling about my life, mm-hmm. uh, in fact, it was my coach, uh, you know, he leaned in and he was like, do you want to keep telling that story? And I went, can I tell a different one? Mm-hmm. Went, yeah. And, and that for me was like, what? Okay. Well, what story do I want to tell? Let me create a new one. Let me, you know, and, and I realized like this, this is, this is changeable. I can, I, I don't have to still be this, you know, over here. Mm-hmm. What everyone told me I was or wasn't. I'm like, who am I today? I get to decide that and define it and be it. Cool. And and really, once you do that, you're empowering yourself to yeah. to know that it's up to you. It is not up to anyone else mm-hmm. to you know save you or to you know give you permission. It's up to you to decide and then to begin to align your behavior and your thought 
process with it so that it's believable. Because if you yeah. decide and then these things aren't matching, it's going to be like, yeah, this doesn't work. And uh, I love that. I love that. You are empowering yourself. And I mean, just for everybody who sees that, it doesn't mean that you have to drop out of college uh, or, or move abroad. That doesn't happen. <laughs> that is not the step everybody needs to take. It's just, right. uh, it, it were the steps where we had that type of clarity uh, as an effect, right? This is not, this is not, you set out to do these things to reinvent yourself. They just happen and they're like, wow. This is amazing uh, and it can be done in similar steps it can be done in smaller steps mm -hmm. yeah that's why it's, it's just really important just to start today we don't have yesterday's done today you know today is what you have tomorrow is you know is not yet here yeah. and so if we can operate from right now who do i want to be today and what will that look like yeah. uh, and then celebrating that and really you know recognizing like oh Cool. I did something different. You know, it was. It's just a different. It's a. It's a conscious awareness of hmm, how am I showing up today? And, and rather than just defaulting to you know this automated, um, you know, system where we're we're being present and we're saying this is something that I want to try differently today. Let me let me see what how this feels. Um, and the more that you do that, the more you you become it. You know, it becomes habitual for you. So, yeah. Thank you so much. So if you see that and you feel drawn to work with Katrina or with me or invite the two of us because we have a workshop and talk that we give together on confidence and identity. Um, similar topic here, but lots more to explore, especially more interactive. Uh, then please reach out. The information is somewhere below. Wherever you see this, you will find our contact information. Yep. And before we close, Katrina, my my favorite question. Uh, it's it's probably easier for you because you have daughters that age. But what advice would you give your sixteen year old self? You know, I would say, be you, be unapologetically you, and and begin to really get creative with that now because who you are today is you're you're, you're going to continue to to work on that question and um and and trust that whoever whomever you decide to be is is the right person right person right now yep yeah. oh, i love that yeah love that thank you so much for having me this is fun Thank you, Katrina. There was there's so um, there were so many beautiful sentences and, and insights and thoughts in that. Thank you for being here with me today. And yeah, people, you see that? Reach out to Katrina. Uh, she has a lot more to say about these things. She's an amazing coach. And invite the two of us. We love to do in-person events. So yeah. we'd love to to do a workshop for your company, group, whatever. Ask yeah, us. Absolutely. I'm in. Yep. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. And Katrina, again, thank you. I'll talk to you very soon. Yeah, and thanks for reach me. out, uh, people, give us comments and questions. We'll get back to you soon. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Bye bye.